On this episode of the Commute Podcast, I talked to Pierre Bouvard with Westwood One. He is a marketer, works in radio advertising, and this was a really cool episode for me because I got to talk about a subject that I really love, which is marketing. I started my career in marketing, and the genesis of shared share mobility started with an idea about advertising and self-driving cars and how autonomous vehicle experiences were going to create a world where everyone is a passenger. I think advertising has the potential to fully cover the cost of the ride and create transportation that is one day free. So Pierre and I talk about um, some research about the commute, how it's not as bad as people think in regards to how many people are working from home, and that um, a lot of people think radio is dead. And Pierre's going to tell us why it's live, well, and actually really, really innovative. So this is a cool conversation today with Pierre Bouvard about radio advertising in the connected car. So I'm very excited about this conversation on the Continue podcast today because I get to talk about marketing. It's something that uh, it's where I started my career. It's also what started my pursuit of uh, getting involved in the mobility industry and the automotive industry. So very excited to have Pierre Bouvard with Westwood One on the podcast. And today we're gonna to talk about the intersection of marketing, mobility, and how it's impacting the commute. So Pierre, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, Westwood One, huge organization, um, represent a lot of uh, very well-known brands. Maybe give a little background on yourself and your organization. Sure. So um, I'm the chief insights officer. So I work with marketers and agencies on creating uh, targeting solutions to help them find the right audience and measurement solutions to, you know, prove impact of audio. Um, our parent company is Cumulus Media, and so we own about 450 radio stations all across the country in about uh, 80 or so uh, markets. And then Westwood One is a big national network. So if you ever have been in the car at night listening to Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football or Thursday Night Football or March Madness or Olympics, uh, you've probably were listening to a Westwood One affiliate. We also have music countdown shows and, you know, national syndicated formats of all shape and size. So we're, we're a big audio organization. We're big into podcast. We're a top five, you know, podcast sales house. So pretty much all things audio. Yeah, you guys have really evolved to be a modern media company, um, but have a legacy in radio. You know, most, most people, I mean, maybe that's a misconception on my part, but is the car and the commute, the primary um, time and, and venue when people are listening to the radio today? Um, you know, there is this myth uh, that radio is, uh, it, you know, you buy it in drive times, quote unquote. And, and people are always surprised to find out that if you just look at these time periods of like Monday through Friday, six to 10 in the morning, three to seven in the afternoon, that's only 40% of radio listening. And the other 60% is middays, nights, and weekends. And in fact, the highest rated time period is actually Monday through Friday, 10 to three. It's actually middays. Um, about 40% of radio listening is in car. About um, a third or so is at home and about 20% or so is at work. Um, so it's, yes, the car is important. Um, you get a lot of reach in the car, but you know, we do have home and work are also major sources of uh, uh, audio time spent. And so um, the report I originally found that you had put out that kind of connected us originally was about um, maybe some common misperceptions about the impact of the commute? Maybe talk a little bit about sure. that. So when COVID struck in um, April and May and major cities saw shutdowns occurring and in, in office buildings closed and, and commutes were curtailed, um, there was a myth that no one in America is on the road. 
no one's driving, everyone is at home, and no one's listening to radio. Um, and yes, there, there were, we did see in the, uh, the geo, geopath data, which is the outdoor advertising audience measurement data, there was in the big cities in April and May last of 2020, there was a downtick, but it quickly snapped back. And in fact, through the end of the year, um, miles traveled in America is actually greater than last year at the same time. But if you're a New York-based uh, media planner or you know agency strategist, and you're at home, you know a lot of times you forget to take the me out of media, so you project your personal life situation onto all of America. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we actually uh, retained a company by the name of Advertiser Perceptions in October. We actually asked them to do a study of 300 media buyers and planners, both at the agency and the brands to say, hey, what percent of America is commuting every day, you know, working from home or out of the workforce? And then from the very same period, we went to the uh, Federal Reserve, who is doing a, a tracking study of actually what's happening in America. Is, is this the study that I have uh, the slides on? Should I you bring do. Those up? You yeah, do. let me bring those up while you talk to it. Talk yeah. To so, um, you know, this is kind of the, the clash of uh, perception and reality. So the, uh, if you go full screen on the first slide there, um, this is what uh, agencies and advertisers think is going on in America. And this was fielded very recently in October. So they think about a third of America's commuting every day, about a third is commuting some days, uh, whopping 43% of Americans working from home every single day, mm -hmm. and then one out of five Americans out of the workforce. So that's the perception among you know, people that control media budgets. Now, if you go to the next slide, here's reality from the US Federal Reserve. And marketers and their agencies um, really um, missed the boat pretty dramatically. So the blue represents reality from the Federal Reserve. The gray bars represent advertiser agency perception. So there are almost um, twice as many daily commuters, the 55 versus the 32, as is perceived by um, agencies and advertisers. And then if we skip over to work from home every day, uh, it's almost half. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the agencies and advertisers are dramatically overestimating how many Americans are working from home. Yeah. They're, they're also dramatically overestimating how many Americans are out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so the point here is that if you are an agency and you think, you know, everyone's working from home, then your reaction is, well, don't buy outdoor advertising. Don't buy billboards. Don't buy radio because, gosh, everybody's working from home. And the reality is that media planners are not representative of America and they should resist the temptation to project their personal worldview onto America. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is just the trend from the uh, Federal Reserve. So they started this study um, and they interviewed cons Americans who were workers prior to the pandemic. So you can see prior to the pandemic, 92% of Americans would go somewhere outside of their home and work, and about 8% work from home full time. No doubt, you, you see the impact of the pandemic in May. Um, mm -hmm. Work from home jumped up 26%, 19% of the people uh, out of the workforce. But then look at the trend through spring and summer. The uh, people commuting grew as we get to November, the, the people commuting went from 55% in May to 72% in November. The work from home has dropped from 26% in May to 18% uh, in November. And the folks that are out of the workforce has also dropped 19 to 11%. Now, no doubt we are not out of the woods. We're not back to you know, pre-pandemic, but we're pretty much two thirds or more of the way back. And so 
when you can really look at real consumer data, mm -hmm. you know, this shows you that guess what? Four times as many Americans are commuting to work as, as work from home. Now, what type of data sources are being used to project these um, activities? So this is the U.S. Federal Reserve. They are doing a, literally a national consumer study every single month. And they're, so they're tracking, you know, they're researching consumers every month and saying, hey, are you commuting, working from home or not employed? Um, so that's one source of data. The next slide, I think, is um, another source of data. Uh, this is Geopath. So this is the outdoor um, advertising industries data set. They're harvesting tens of millions of households worth of cell phone data. Mm -hmm. And they're tracking literally how many miles that consumers are traveling in a typical day, in a typical month. And this slide here is benchmarking this year versus last year. So if you look at the month of March, mostly pre-pandemic, miles traveled in America this past March, 6% greater than March of 19. Hmm. Okay, and now here you have April, there's the shutdown, right? So big 36% drop, miles traveled 36% lower this March versus last March, or excuse me, April. Then you see a recovery in mm -hmm. May, 12%. And then by the time June rolls around, all the way right through today, there are actually more miles traveled month by month by month versus the prior month. So Americans are back in their cars <laughs> and, and they're rolling around. And if you go to the next slide, I think we- um, Do you think this is commute driven or travel driven? Like, uh, I, yeah, I think tourism. it's everything, everything driven. Um, it's also what you're seeing and you're seeing it here with the Apple data is Americans are avoiding public transit. So Apple has this very cool website that we've provided here at the bottom of the slide and they harvest data from the Apple maps app. So every time you go and you're, you know, requesting a walking trip or public transit trip, or a driving trip, they're aggregating and harvesting this data. And through this website, you can pull up any country in the world, any city in America, any state. And this is, you know, it looks like the same pattern. And what they're indexing against is January 13th, which was just a random pre-COVID day that they selected. Mm -hmm. So you see the major drop in the month of April, you see the fast recovery in May. And by the time June rolls around, you know, it's exceeding prior year, but look at the gray bar. Public transit is still 50% below pre-COVID norms. So we're seeing more vehicular traffic because of avoidance of public transit. Do advertising professionals think about the commuter uh, segment that is using public transit as a audience they're trying to reach? Well, you know, there is in the major cities, you know, there is, um, there's billboards mm -hmm. in, you know, subway stations, subway ads. bus sites. So it is, it's a portion of outdoor advertising. It's a segment, it's called mm -hmm. transit, you know, basically. So yes, you know, what this is saying is that audiences for that segment of out of home are probably lower, but you know, if you have a billboard on the side of the road, you know, whatever you lost on the uh, public transit ads, you're gaining on the, uh, you know, on the side of the highway. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see, you know, traffic is greater than, than pre-COVID. Um, for the digital advertising in uh, radio, is that pretty programmatic at this point where it's, it's data driven? Um, I wouldn't say it's all programmatic. I mean, I, I couldn't give you a hard percentage of overall streaming audio. I, I'm going to guess it's probably 80% placed still the way it's always been placed and 20% maybe programmatic. Um, there definitely is data, you know, that can give you demographics. It can mm -hmm. give you, you know, purchase behavior that's being used. The interesting thing about radio is that you can learn a lot by the programming format. 
in what I mean by programming format, think top 40, mm -hmm. classic rock, country. You know, we know a lot about those programming formats and the purchase habits mm -hmm. of folks that listen to those. The other interesting thing is that unlike TV, on a typical TV network, every show has a different profile a movie versus a scripted original versus, you know, uh, a reality show, those audiences look totally different. Mm -hmm. But a radio station that plays classic rock, they don't change their format every hour. They just do one thing. They play right. classic rock. So you can use the purchase insights data for classic rock, and you can apply that across the entire station, morning, noon, and night. Yeah. And also by city. So the profile of the classic rock listener in Bend, Oregon is gonna look very similar to the classic rock profile of a New York City station. So it's actually easier to target in audio because the content is so consistent on, on the platform. I don't think it's been figured out yet, but I think mobility is gonna have similar categorizations where somebody that's a transit user meets a specific profile or somebody that's using, um, uh, mixed mode scooter and bike together might might fit a different profile. You, now that we have a lot more data about how they're using these, you know, mobility and transit systems. Yeah, no doubt. And, and um, you know, it's interesting. We used to base our insights on the physical location mm -hmm. of the inventory. You know, so if a board was sitting in the South Bronx, we would say, oh, you know, that's a, that's that zip code is, you know, below index, but the billboard, the audience, what is the audience for that? Well, the audience could be totally different. They could be coming down I-95 from mm -hmm. Connecticut and be very upscale. So I agree with you. I think being able to focus on the audience, not just the physical location of the outdoor inventory. One of my beliefs has always been that Google cares about the autonomous vehicle because of the in vehicle opportunity that they have in being able to capture somebody in a maybe third screen or a, or a new place. How do you see autonomous vehicles being an opportunity for radio or advertisers? Well, at the moment, you know, we can show a visual in the dashboard. So um, in, in like a current car, like a modern yes. car radio, you yes. actually have a visual like a Static, static visual. So when the radio ad is playing, you know, we can have a logo of the brand. Mm -hmm. um, but because of national highway tra traffic safety, I mean, you can't have a visual that moves because that would be distracting. Correct. Correct. Um, so, you know, look, uh, we know that like the audience to this podcast, probably a fair number of people are watching it on YouTube. Yep. A lot of our podcasts, we know people are watching on YouTube. Um, so look, when the, um, the car becomes autonomous, can we have that radio morning show show the video of in studio so they can see the Ariana Grande interview in the studio? Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. we just have not, for safety's sake, uh, wanted to be too distracting in the car to show a moving visual. So I've found that the automakers are very, very hesitant to let anyone into that uh, walled garden that is the IVI system or the in-vehicle entertainment system. Um, there's not a lot of apps that work in the car. The If you think about like Google um, or Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, their functionality and the apps that work in them are very, very limited. And I, I think automakers know the value of that screen. And I can see more streaming services like a la what Tesla's doing, you know, where Tesla basically kind of recreated the Pandora system to do their own radio network. Yeah. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, if the slides are still up, I think we have, um, yeah, this yeah, is just Nielsen. time to kind of grow and keep going there. I think I put in some Edison Shiravir, try the next slide here. Yeah, yeah. here you go. So, so this is in-car share of ear, meaning share of audio time spent in the car among ad-supported platforms, you know, places where you could actually buy an ad. So SiriusXM, 
80% of their audience is to music, which are not ad supported. They're spoken word channels, mm -hmm. you know, except ads. Um, obviously podcasts accept ads and both Pandora and Spotify do have an ad supported platform. So, you know, you can see we're basically a 90 share of ad supported audio in the car. Yeah. And could it be that, you know, in an autonomous vehicle, that quote radio station becomes a TV station, meaning now you can see the morning show and you can see Ariana Grande. It could very well be. Has, um, has there been anything for consumer protection to retain that radio signal as like a free access point to the consumer? Well, I mean, when car makers see these charts and they do their own surveys, they realize like, hey, this is what people use in yeah. the car, you know? So it's, it is a critical platform for entertainment, information, you know, et cetera. So it's still looked at as from the automaker perspective, they have to accommodate the consumer's desire for radio in the car versus looking at coming after that revenue. I, you know, I can't speak um, to their business plans. Now, I will say mm -hmm. that there's a, a very innovative company called Xperi, um, um, and they have a what they call a hybrid radio. And what that means is it's a radio that is both over the air and streaming. So it does both together. Mm -hmm. So, for example, imagine you're driving out of Dallas, you're listening to a radio station, and now you're out of the signal range of the station this radio will automatically switch over to the internet stream of that station, giving you kind of a seamless handoff from over the air to the online audio. Do they have national coverage and signal? Well, remember that an internet stream- Oh, uh, it originates as an internet stream, not as a uh, radio? Other way around. So it's a hybrid radio. So you start, you, if you're in Dallas and you listen to a Dallas station, you know, that it's the over the air signal, but the radio is smart enough to realize when you, when I lose that signal, I can keep you tuned to that station via the internet stream. Got it. Do they have to work with the automakers? Oh yeah. To Xperi, make that work? Yeah. Xperi is, you know, one of the leading providers. They, they invented a technology called HD radio. Okay. And right, right now, something like 60% or 70% of all new radios and new vehicles are in Xperi HD radio, you know, radio. Um, so they're, they're the leading provider of, you know, audio for the, for the American vehicle. This, this is the new hybrid radio you were telling me about. Yeah. It's, yep. it's over the air and stream. That's yep. pretty cool. I can yep. imagine that sets up a lot of opportunity for programmatic advertising. Um, because if they're, if they have a relationship with the automaker so that they know the location of that vehicle, that sets it up for a whole lot of other things and there's a lot of value to be had there. Correct, correct. Um, and I think one of the other interesting things when you talk about the automakers, um, you know, General Motors, uh, there was a piece in Forbes recently, they partnered with Taco Bell and they did a study among their 9 million connected cars. So they have a huge array of vehicles of all shape and size that are continuously feeding back to GM, you know, minute by minute, all sorts of data on how the car's performing and safety, but also minute by minute audience data on what you're listening to in the car and is it at an audible level. Mm -hmm. So Taco Bell was able to see which vehicles were exposed to their ads, um, which vehicles were not and then where the vehicle went. And so they were able to really connect the dots between exposure and you know, visitation of their restaurants. That's all enabled by that, the, you know, the power of the connected car. Correct. GM's done some other really cool things like their use case with the weather channel in aggregating the windshield wiper data and then <laughs> selling it to the weather channel. So weather channel has accurate rainfall data across the entire country, levering GM's, leveraging GM's fleet. And it's, right. these are just scratching the surface. You know, Taco Bell's a pretty um, 
innovative advertiser. They've got a large budget to try these things. Um, but it's probably only a matter of time where you could buy it as easy as you're buying Google ads, right? Well, the, I think the, the equally exciting for American radio is it, the connected car offers the opportunity of attribution, meaning mm -hmm. connecting the dots between exposure to a radio ad and retail visitation on a mass scale. You know, because when you have 10 million, 20 million GM connected cars and that data is flowing continuously, you could imagine a radio station with a dashboard and they could show a retailer, you know, here's when your ad started, here's, um, you know, the cars or the vehicles that were exposed and look at the lift in retail visitation to your stores, you know, among the vehicles that were exposed to your radio ads. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's super exciting for the radio industry to be able to prove, you know, that radio can drive retail traffic. Well, I'm sure like a lot of industries, you're trying to make sure that you've got long-term relevance and you're not finding your way to be the Xerox, right? Everybody, nobody wants to be Xerox um, as things are changing. So one of the things I spend a lot of time on are trying to get people together in a car to share their commute. Um, do you have any thoughts about opportunity for advertising in a shared vehicle? Well, yes. Um, look at children. Um, so Nielsen measures uh, radio listening among children over among people over the age of six. And how they do that is everyone in a Nielsen uh, audio panel gets something called the portable people meter and it just okay. clips onto your belt or your purse, and you don't have to do anything. It just hears what you hear. All TV and radio signals in America are encoded uh, with a unique identifier for this meter. And so just the fact that you're within earshot of a radio station in the car, it logs in that listenership. And so you can see the out-of-home listening among six to 11-year-olds. You can see the spike you know, from seven to 8.30 in the morning, a sharp mm -hmm. drop off. And then you can see at 2.30 or three o'clock up it pops. So that in car with mom and dad exposure to kids, you know, kind of drive time to and from school. And then of course, on the weekends, you know, when they're being taken to the soccer game or they're doing errands with their parents, you can see the simultaneous exposure from everyone in that household that happened to be in the car. Wow. Yeah, I think I've been looking for different ways to be able to advertise during the commute, just because I think that's a, a that's where I find my audience. You know, finding people that are commuting. But I'm I'm just so fascinated with the work that you guys have been doing, and just overall how marketing and transportation are kind of like this essential partnership. Um, I believe one day the value of advertising to someone in vehicle could and could potentially exceed the cost of the ride. And so imagine that all you have to do is get someone into the vehicle and the value of their time in that vehicle pays for the ride itself. I think it's, it's something like uh, 45 cents a mile or something that we would need to be able to generate in Per, per person in revenue. Um, but I, th I think there's a future there. And that, that would allow for giving free transportation in exchange for sharing your data. Now we got to get consumers comfortable with that idea because you're going to have to share some specific data points for your ride to be that valuable. Well, no doubt. And, you know, consumers realize that that's happening today you know, when they uh, look at a pair of shoes, you know, and then all of a sudden those shoes are following them around the internet, yep. um, you know. So I, I think I think your point of a more upfront trade-off, not the sleaziness of digital media, yep. you know, where no one gave their permission and, you know, they're being spied on and, and harassed left and right, but where it's a more, you know, if you think about it, you know, there, there are... Um, there's subscription options that are ad-free, mm -hmm. and then there are 
uh, entertainment platforms that are free, but you have ads. Yep. And I think there's a, a fair um, uh, trade-off there that people say like, okay, you know, I'll hear ads for free Spotify or free Pandora. Yep. Um, and to say, you know, I get a free car ride. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, in exchange for, you know, consenting to be exposed to some ads. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think definitely, you know, maybe that's Uber's next big play. <laughs> it, it might be. Um, I'm still too concerned about the consumer perceptions of advertising. You know how Facebook mobile, they were just desperate to get people to use it. So they put no ads in it until everybody was hooked. Um, I think that's where we're at in regards to shared mobility today is that we can't go making it this advertising experience or we'll turn off the consumer before they've learned to love it. But it's, it's something, an, it's an opportunity I think we earn down the road. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, when you get into the back of a New York City taxi cab and then, a, you know, a blaring video screen comes at you with the same, you know, clips of, you know, Cheetos or whatever. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you, it has to be done. But, you know, look, look at these slides if they're still up. I mean, you know, AMFM has figured this out. We're getting a 90 share. There's it's ad supported people willingly tune it on. So it's yep. not out of the realm that uh, you can have an entertaining medium that picks you up, makes you feel good, has ads that are relevant and useful to you. Well, I think the big lesson here in our conversation was the take me out of media statement. And many, many people like me that are working at the edges of innovation in mobility may have an idea that things are going to be done faster or different or that everybody wants it to be a different way. But when you look at the number of consumers still using advertising, the way things are being done may be the way that people want them to be done. And so maybe it's more about working within what consumers want today instead of trying to create some drastic new future that we're not sure they even want yet. Yeah. And look, um, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, famously said if he had done a market research study, you know, before the iPad came out asking people, you know, would they want the iPad? Yep. Um, they probably would have not understood and probably said no. So sometimes you do have to create the future, expose it to people and, and you know, and see what happens. Um, but it is interesting, you know, there's a lot of behavioral science that if you create something new, put something familiar around it. And that helps you get more um, attraction. So the famous story is, you know, the first sushi, uh, sushi chef in LA, um, he wrapped, uh, he, he reversed the rice around the sushi and he put it on the outside. And, and so people saw the rice and were like, oh, rice, I know rice, I like rice. Um, and then the sushi was on the inside. Um, and so it was something familiar with something new and that helped get something new adopted. That's a great lesson as we're trying to get people to change behavior and do a lot of new things. Um, Pierre, this, thanks for coming on the podcast today and sharing some of this research. I think it's really fascinating. And I know that a lot of people are trying to figure out how to monetize the time that someone is spending in a car, um, but it's being done for decades and you guys are finding new ways to do it. So uh, thanks for coming on the Commute Podcast. Thanks for the opportunity. This was a lot of fun. Appreciate it.